Hi, everybody, and welcome to One Day in MR, How Spatial Computing Affects Everyday Life. So probably the first question a lot of you are wondering is, who is this guy and why should I care what he has to say about MR? Well, hello, my name is Eric Newman. I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft, working on the HoloLens in the mixed reality organization. And I am completely obsessed with MR. I've been working dedicated to virtual and augmented reality since about 2014. Uh, and in that time, I've started a couple of startups with uh, various levels of success. And of course, now I'm here at Microsoft. Um, also during that time, I've made a habit of making myself a canary in the coal mine, putting myself out there to help further our industry, this industry that I'm so passionate about that I believe is gonna really transform our species and culture. Um, I've included this picture here as an example. Uh, this is actually a photogrammetry avatar of myself which was furnished to me by High Fidelity back a couple of years ago. And I, I went so far as to make this freely available to the entire internet to do whatever they want with, just to see what would happen. And that's the kind of essence that I'm trying to bring to this experiment today. So as the talk is called One Day in MR, probably a lot of you are wondering, why do this? Why bother spending a whole day wearing the HoloLens? Um, and to answer that question, I want to sort of wind back the clock a little bit, back to, I think it was 2014. Um, and basically in 2014, I had, I had just left one of my startups. I was doing contracting and consulting, and I was, I was really becoming super interested in, in virtual and augmented reality, what we now hear at Microsoft called mixed reality. And at the time, there was basically nothing. The whole industry was nascent. Um, there was a, a really early Oculus that had come out. There was sort of proto cardboards that were existing. Uh, maybe I think cardboard existed too, but like really there was, there was nothing that was out there in the world. And I wanted to do an activity, do an experiment, um, do a, almost a research study to, uh, to help me understand how to get into working on this new nascent space. And so what I did is I, I cast this wide net, I mean, this huge list of all the books, TV shows, movies, everything, all kind of media that I could find that made reference to virtual or augmented reality. And then I consumed all of them. And uh, I wrote these two articles, which I'll link below. Um, and they went pseudo viral in the VR and AR space. But the, the point of this story is that consuming all these things allowed me to have some insights about what our cultural expectations were about the ways that virtual and augmented reality, mixed reality should make us feel. And I took those sort of like feeling-based insights and I used them to drive my work in startups and my work in this space, which I really strongly believe has helped make me successful. So I highly recommend going and checking out those articles and reading and consuming as much sci-fi as you can. I know that's an odd thing to hear, but it really is relevant when you're at the, the, the precipice of creating new tech like this. So anyway, the, the reason why I say this is because when I received HoloLens to do some, some work a few months ago, I, I realized that I was presented with a similar opportunity. But unlike in 2013, there is real stuff. There's real tech. This is an actual device that I could put on. I didn't have to go to science fiction. I could actually sit down, put this thing on, and really put it through its paces, which, of course, I did very quickly. Um, but I didn't get a chance to stress it in a consumery way, right? So uh, this brings us to this picture that you see above me right here. So this gentleman is uh, is clearly working in a factory of some sort. He's very intensely examining whatever that virtual sprocket is in his hand. He's got some data, some metrics. This is what the HoloLens 2 is designed for, right? It's, it's a, not a consumer device. It's an enterprise device. There is no miscommunication about this. I don't want you guys to get the wrong idea. I know this, but I still wanted to know what can I learn from these capabilities? All the convergence, all the tech that's packed into this new device, what can I learn about how the AR future might look and feel by wearing this thing? Um, and on top of that, like, I just, I have it. I know that, that the HoloLens 2 is super hot. It's out of many people's price point uh, out in the indie sort of MR world. So I figured I would go and I would do this, this study, this very unscientific study, wear this device, and then report back to the world and tell you all how it goes. But the most important reason why I want to do this is that I had some very specific ideas 
predictions, you might call them, about what we will get out of wearing mixed reality devices all day long. And I wanted to put those to the test. So the first one of those ideas is, I think, really well succinctly put by what you see here in this image. Um, this GIF is from, I think, about 2015. Uh, I didn't make it. There's a link down below. But um, what you can see here is that it starts in the 80s. And over the last 30 years, everything that's involved in our lives has moved into the computer. Uh, our social lives, our work, obviously all kinds of research, banking, shopping, everything has gone from being out here in the real world to going into the computer. Um, computer, phone, whatever you wanna call it. It's on the other side of a screen. It's no longer physical. I'll also note that this GIF does have some uh, some Macs in it, but uh, I figured it was okay because they have PowerPoint and, and Excel on them. You can see it way down there, those, those icons right there. Um, but the point is, is that we're not gonna be able to put this process back in the bag. I don't think that we're all gonna wake up someday and say, oh, you know what? Let's be Luddites. Let's, uh, let's get rid of all of our digital conveniences. Let's get rid of streaming videos. Let's get rid of social media. Let's go back to having letters and uh, telegrams. I, I don't believe that. I don't think that most people out in the world believe that either. So we really have to learn how to live with this situation that we've created for ourselves. And the situation is that we've abstracted ourselves out of our entire lives, really. So that brings me to this slide and this quote. This quote comes from a neuroscience paper from a research study that was done, I think back in 2013. The quote is, for hundreds of millions of years, animals developed exceedingly more intricate nervous systems for the main purpose of achieving mastery over concrete objects in their surroundings. The key here being concrete, right? So translating this back, what this says is, we are physical beings, we live in a physical world, and our brain is mostly dedicated to knowing and understanding what's going on in that physical world to prevent us from coming from harm, to allow us to thrive and succeed and keep our species going. But as we just saw on that last slide, our world doesn't revolve around physical objects anymore. We've, we've removed the physicality, the concreteness from our entire existence. And so what we're doing instead is as each one of those things moved onto the other side of the screen, it went from being concrete to being what's called symbolic. And as soon as it became symbolic, we stopped being able to use most of our brain, most of our physical capabilities for processing, stop being able to apply to them. And what we need to do then is we need to use this little bit of our brain, which has evolved for symbolic processing. Really, it's evolved for language and we're overloading it. We're using it to translate every symbol that we see on the screen for banking and social life and entertainment and shopping and, and all of these different things. We're translating every single one of those things back into something that the rest of our brain can process and understand. We're essentially doing the work of re-physicalizing, re-concretizing uh, symbols in our brains so that we can process what we're seeing on the screen. And I believe that this is extremely taxing. I believe that this is costing us a huge amount of our mental capabilities. We're, we're expending our processing energies, our, our capacity on doing this work. And if we were able to remove that work, I think that we would free up our minds and our brains for doing a lot more. I, I also think that bluntly, uh, this is a big part of the reason why we all feel so exhausted at the end of a day of staring at a screen because we're cooking this little piece of our, you know, meat computer <laughs> in order to, uh, to do this kind of translation. My hope, my sincere hope is that uh, mixed reality will allow us to clip out that work, will allow us to re-physicalize the virtual and in so save all that capacity. And if you take a, a moment to just pause and reflect on what that would mean, if that capacity was freed up for everybody across our species, that's a tremendous win. For, for us as humanity. I'm very excited by that idea. So the next thing I wanna talk about is this concept of connectedness, right? Human contact. I don't think that there's many people who would disagree that, that we have 
lost some aspect of human contact alongside that physicality as we've made things go more and more inside the computer, right? I mentioned that you used to go to the bank, um, you know, and now you do it online. But when you went to the bank, there was a person that you talked to. There was a person that you saw, right? And even today, you'll be sitting on the couch next to your friend or your spouse or your family or whoever it is, and you'll be watching a show and on your phone. You'll be at a restaurant pre-quarantine life. You'll be at a restaurant having a conversation. And everybody has their phones face up just in case some message comes in. Right? And, and this image here that you see of the phone and the headset, I think is really symbolic or emblematic of the transition that I think we're gonna have. Right now, we're all walking around glued, tethered, grown into, however you wanna describe it, to our phones. And this is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. It's given us a different kind of connection. It gives us a connection to people who are far away. It gives us an expanded connection to our world, but it definitely gets in between us and the people who are standing right next to us. And I think that you can see this here, right? People, like I said, they're always looking at the concept of putting on goggles or putting on a headset and thinking that's gonna make me feel isolated. And just like is in this picture, I like to point out like, you already walk around like this. What I'm saying is that we could have something which lets us do this. And let's, let's drill right into this, right? The very simple act of eye contact is actually really, really important. And we don't get it from any of our technological means of communication. It's obviously not there in text or email. It's obviously not there in phone. But what's not as obvious is that you can't even make eye contact with a human being through a webcam. Because if you're looking at the camera, you're not looking at the screen where the other person's eyes are. And if you're looking at the screen, you're not looking at the camera. So no matter how you slice it, two people are never making eye contact over a webcam. And that simple little activity, it, I'm not gonna go so deeply into the, the neuroscience of this as I did into the previous, but there's, there's stuff inside us which is keyed into eye contact in a very, very deep and meaningful way. And you can feel it when it's there and you can feel it when it's not. And I hope that like we see in this little microcosm of the eye contact, that mixed reality is gonna allow us to reconnect with our fellow people by, by freeing us and untethering us, by letting the digital leak back out. Um, it allows us to share our digital with other people. And so I'd, I'd like to see that in my day as well. So the next concept that I wanted to test is the concept of superpowers, right? Uh, what kind of superpowers can we gain from mixed reality? And this is a term that gets kind of thrown around in the tech space. And so I wanna like really zoom into this and explain what I mean when I talk about superpowers. So I've included this, this little meme here, this clip it from Reddit, I think from back in 2014, and it goes like this. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life today? And the answer is, I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. Right, and so obviously this is a very funny uh, example of this kind of a situation, but I think it's poignant to this moment. What it shows us is that our technological capabilities advance so quickly that the things that we choose to do with them appear nonsensical or magical uh, to people from just a few decades before these capabilities existed. Maybe the more canonical example of technological superpowers driven by convergence comes from ride sharing. So I want to talk about this for a moment, right? The smartphone is basically magic, right? It, 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 come, it came around 10 or 15 years ago, and it gave us all these wonderful new capabilities. So let's talk about a technology that came out long, long before that, the technology of the taxi. Basically, since the creation of the taxi, people have been joking about how difficult it is to get a ride in a taxi, right? You've, everybody's seen this in a movie. Everybody's heard this. Maybe a lot of us have tried it. I used to live in New York. Getting a taxi is insanely difficult. It's just fraught with complexity. You never know where they're gonna be. You have to line up with them right at the right time. It's just very difficult. And so along comes a smartphone 10 or 15 years ago. And just by putting a couple of capabilities together, an all the time data connection, the ability to run apps, GPS, all together. That's really all it took. Putting these three capabilities in a person's pocket, presto changeo gave the superpower of being able to, to call a car directly to you. 
get picked up wherever you are, even without an address. Now imagine trying to explain that to somebody just from like the 90s, right? It would be seen as essentially magic, especially to a city dweller, to be able to just call a car to them at any time. And we barely think about it today. It's just a normal part of our existence. When I set out to do this experiment with the HoloLens, I wanted to know what are the superpowers that are gonna show up for me just from wearing this device, this not even consumer design device, what is here already for me to glom onto? So because the concepts that I'm testing are so emotionally driven, the way that things feel, uh, I thought what better way than to represent them here in my talk than by using some of my favorite uh, Windows 10 built-in emojis. I actually really like these, they're vector, they scale up really nice. Um, so I've got the four here, reduce cognitive burden symbolized by this brain, Increased human contact, symbolized by this eyeball in the speech bubble. Superpowers by our super cat here. And then surprises by this donut, which is unfortunately cut off a little bit by my head. So let's talk about what I actually did. I originally intended to wear the device straight through an entire work day. And I honestly, I would have been able to do that no problem. Um, it's very comfortable, it's light, it flips up and down. Uh, with plugged into a battery, I can get all day life out of it, really no problem. But I realized that if I did do just a work day, it would be kind of boring. Uh, I wouldn't get to show off or experience or explore all the other kinds of things that I do away from my desk. So uh, sorry for the misnomer here, but my one day in MR is actually one half work day and one half weekend day. Forgive me. So enough setup, let's get into it. What you're seeing here is a first-person capture taken from the internal uh, picture-taking capabilities of the HoloLens using the mixed reality capture stuff that's built right in. And what you see here is two big edge slates that are just open. Slates being the word that we use to describe windows in mixed reality. So these slates are open here and uh, I have teams in them. And I blurred it out because this is my actual real world teams uh, work images. So I, I couldn't, you know, share that sort of stuff, but this was, great, you know, uh, I was able to do my work and, and keep teams up like I normally would on my monitor. Um, and it, just so you know, this is equally applicable to any other kind of web application. You could use this to run, watch Netflix in bed. Uh, I also used it to listen to some Spotify. And this was just nice. This is the sort of like most fundamental, simple, straightforward way to use mixed reality in your daily life. Use it to run web apps and have them follow you around or mount giant screens around you. So how did this line up against my goals, against my concepts? So I've given this a rating of, uh, of these two things. It did improve my human contact and I do feel like this gave me a little bit of a superpower. So how, how could you possibly say that, that running slate-based web apps increased human contact? Well, I will tell you, the answer is that in my normal quarantine bound life, I'm working out of an office in the basement of my house where I have several big monitors that I use all the time and I really need them. Um, it basically tethers me, it anchors me in this little room away from the other people who live in my house, away from uh, my spouse and my kids and uh, the nanny and the other nanny share kids. And I'm, I'm boxed up and I'm away from all of that. Being able to use these slates and make them uh, wherever I want freed me up from that, allowed me to be back in my own family's space. And then superpowers. Um, I could make them any size I want. I could have any number of them that I want. Normally a monitor costs several hundred dollars and I was able to spawn them at a whim. That is exactly the kind of thing that if you went and discussed this with somebody from 10 years ago, they would say, you know, oh, that's that's magic. I'm sure many of you out there who don't have uh, AR or VR devices in your lives are, are similarly thinking, ooh, I would kill for that superpower. So yeah, this is, this is the, the first place to start. This next one is pretty interesting. So I had heard that there is this new application that had come out. It was called Mirage. It was actually made by somebody who works on a team that I, I work with. Um, it had come out and what this is, is it is a desktop extension. It's a virtual monitor app for the desktop. And so this is essentially a smoother, slicker, way more powerful version of what I just showed you. 
Um, you can see this is super meta, but you can see I'm actually editing this presentation that you guys are witnessing right now in mixed reality. Yeah, I'm pretty serious about dog fooding. Um, but why is this better? Well, there's a couple of things that I had to do in order to work through sort of limitations of using the HoloLens slate. In order to use Teams up there, uh, I either had to use that holographic keyboard that comes built in with the mixed reality operating system with the, the Windows holographic, um, or I had to use my phone or a plugged in keyboard, some other separate input device from my laptop in order to interact with those things. So that meant, yes, I get this big monitor, but I'm also switching back and forth a lot. Um, using this allowed me to just drag windows back and forth between mixed reality and my physical monitor exactly like you would in a real secondary monitor. And so um, I'm really, really glad that I did this experiment because I am now gonna do this like every day. This is gonna be my new way of working. It's so effective and so powerful. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I can't say enough and enough positive things about, uh, about Mirage. Um, if you have a HoloLens, please go check it out. It's incredible. So what rating did I give this? I gave it a rating of increased human contact, increased superpowers and surprise. So human contact and superpowers for the same two reasons as the previous slates. And then surprise because I was just delighted. I didn't anticipate that this was gonna be so smooth and so polished and so just absolutely ready for everyday use. I was really, really impressed. Okay, this is great. Uh, I really like this, this application. This is called Spatial. Um, so throughout my day, you know, obviously like, like pretty much everybody else, I spend a lot of time talking on video calls, on, on web calls using Teams, really all day, every day, all the time these days. Uh, I'm, I'm in a web conference of some sort or another. Um, Spatial is an app that exists on the HoloLens and across a couple of other platforms that lets people snap a photo of themselves, generate a new avatar based on that photo. So sort of like my photogrammetry avatar from the beginning, but just with one shot. Um, and then jump into virtual conferences with other people. And you're able to bring in all kinds of media. You can bring in uh, links and searches and images and 3D models and all kinds of different things. One of the really great things about this is that it actually um, connects directly to a Microsoft account. So I was able to pull in documents and stuff like that. Now, I know probably some of you are looking at this and saying, well, what are you guys doing just looking at a picture of a HoloLens? Again, I can't show you my real work. So I, I staged this a little bit. Uh, and you can see that the person who's, who's here with me, uh, this is my friend, Mike Schultz. Um, he and I actually meet socially in VR quite often or in AR quite often. And sometimes we'll just jump into spatial and we'll use this instead of a web call. You know, and it's, it really is different. Um, so let's talk about what, what score I gave this. So I gave this a brain, an eyeball, and a superhero here. And why did I give it this particular combination? So I think that, um, you know, the eyeball is pretty obvious. This is clearly increasing my human interaction. Just being there and being able to jump on and, and talk to Mike like he's there in my house is just obviously an improvement to human contact. It, it feels like human contact. And why the superpowers? This is teleportation. I mean, this is, is science fiction or superpowers. This is like, if we want to contextualize it against uh, superpowers, this is this is like what Nightcrawler and the X-Men can do, right? Mike just popped into my house and I popped into his house, just like we were there. So those two I think are obvious, but the brain is a little bit less obvious. How is this, how is this decreasing cognitive burden? And so the answer goes back to that original concept of our brains are meant for understanding concrete realities around us. And actually a staggering amount of our, our cognitive capabilities is dedicated to dealing with people. Just thinking about and looking at and understanding the states of other people around us. And we do that from a couple of things. Facial expressions, obviously. Eye contact, eye direction, obviously. Body language, obviously. All of these things, but also even more subtle things like spatial audio, right? Um, it's much easier to pay attention to somebody if you, you're getting sound in both ears than if you're getting it in one ear, like on a phone. Uh, and, and all of these things, Spatial does a great job of putting them together and creating a really physical-like experience. And it just doesn't take as much work. 
you know, we were in this call for maybe an hour and I just, I didn't feel like I was working the same way that I do when I am uh, on a web call. So I thought this is really excellent. I highly recommend Spatial again. Please go check it out if you have, have access to it. Okay, so of course, in a work day, we all need to take breaks, right? And I know that the, the urge is really strong, it's really tempting to use those breaks to go and look at social media, to use those breaks to go and, uh, you know, play some casual game on your phone, to, to do whatever you need to get that kind of break that we require because we're, we're, we're heating up our brain so much from this, all this cognitive burden that I'm talking about, right? But I just went and grabbed one of several fun, simple looking games, just the one that spoke to me. And I was really pretty surprised by it. Um, it was super easy to use. And uh, you'll see here, if you watch for a second, you'll see when I finally get this basket. Oh yeah, that, that little hand pump, that wasn't fake. That was real. <laughs> that was, uh, I was really like stoked to have made that little basket. Um, so let, let's talk about what how I scored this here. So I gave this reduced cognitive burden, in, increased human contact, and a donut. So why, why did I give it all of these things? So again, reduced cognitive burden, right? There were no instructions on this game. I didn't have to think about how to do this. All I did was click a spot on the floor for the basket to go, and then I squeeze my hand and, and the paper shoots out. That's it. There was no effort, no symbolic reasoning that was required at all. This was exactly to my brain like I was throwing a real piece of crumpled paper. The, the enjoyment and the experience that I got, that little kick of delight when it, it went in the basket, it just, it felt real. Um, and why did I give it the eyeball, the increased human contact? Look where I am. I'm in my living room, right? I, I'm standing here doing something silly. This prompted my wife to ask me, what the heck am I doing? In a way that if I had opened up Fortnite or Angry Birds or something like that on my phone, it just wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have sparked that sort of connection. And uh, why the surprise? I was really just surprised by how engaged I was. I didn't notice that fist pump of excitement until after I went back to look at the footage. And I just, I think that there's something to this. I think that there's really a little bit of delight that comes from this kind of just simple, pure, no cognitive burden experience. So we've just slipped over from my workday into my weekend. So I know that at the beginning I said that I'm not a factory worker, right? And obviously that's true, I don't work in a factory, but I have been getting more and more into a little bit of amateur woodworking and just in my personal life. Um, I'm a maker, I like to make things and uh, wood is, cool and interesting. And over the holidays, I got a woodworking router. And one of the projects I've been working on is this router table that you see in front of you. A couple of weeks ago, I, I catted it up in Tinkercad, a free web browser based CAD tool. I exported a model and uh, I dropped it into Spatial so that I could go and check it out. Now, why would I do this? Why would I care to do this? The answer is, is that I wanted to know how it would feel, right? Uh, I had seen the model, I knew in my brain, I knew that it was measured correctly. But what I didn't know is how is that measurement going to translate to the way this table feels when I stand next to it, when it's sitting on top of my existing work table? Is it going to be too tall? Is it going to be too short? Is that work surface space really big enough? Uh, is there really enough room for me to get my hand in there and get to the buttons and the controls on that router? You know, I just, I wasn't sure. And so by dropping it in here, I was able to instantly put all of those concerns to bed. Um, this is, you know, this took me maybe three minutes to go and check out. And I had been spending hours looking at it and, and agonizing over this on my screen. And so that drives us to what rank I gave this. The answer is I gave this a rank of two cognitive burden decreases. Um, this is such a good use case for spatial mixed reality. And I know that this is not a new one. I know that this is not unique. I'm not really bringing a lot of new insights. People have been talking about using augmented reality for trying furniture in houses and stuff like that all the time. But I think when you get into talking about just doing doing this in the, in around your own house and, and in creating stuff, it just is 
it hits the spot. You know, I was able to see this and understand it so quickly. Whereas when I was looking at it on my screen, you know, I have a top view and a side view. I have to compute all of that stuff together in a way that I think most of us are just not wired for. I'm pretty good spatially and I was still struggling with this. So I, I think that this is just really an incredible use case that shows us how easily, how, how much having this kind of a device on our head all the time is just gonna take this kind of work and bring it to the masses, make it available to everyone. You will no longer need to be spatially adept in order to figure these kinds of things out. You'll just be able to try them. Okay, this is my favorite picture in the entire presentation. This was by far the most surprising moment that I had. Um, this is actually a recreation of a moment that I, I had very early when I, I very first got my HoloLens. I, I sort of did this similar thing um, where I wore it all day and I was using it to cook. I cook every day for my family uh, and I decided that I would try a new recipe and rather than use my phone or a tablet or something like that, I would just drop a nice browser window right there in front of my stove so I could look at it. And you know what I discovered? I discovered that dirty fingers can't mess up an augmented reality interface. You can't get chimichurri on a keyboard that doesn't exist. And this is a game changer. Uh, maybe not for the whole wide world, you know, maybe this isn't going to drive that kind of amazing productivity bump of, of decreasing cognitive burden that I was talking about before, but just as a nice little bit of icing on the cake for my day in mixed reality, this was incredible. Um, I, I always find myself cooking, I always find myself getting stuff on my hands, and then it gets on my phone, and then I have to clean it, and it's just a pain. And lots of people cook everybody has to eat. So this is the kind of thing where if if and when AR becomes a daily driver kind of thing, I can't imagine that people are ever going to want to go back to, to using a phone. This is just going to be such a such a, a shift. And so that's why I give this a rating of superpowers and surprise. Um, the ability to type and search and find and, and look and, and see pictures of what I'm trying to do and just not have to worry about getting it dirty or uh, getting it, keep it, like having a place for it to go, just having it naturally take care of itself. Again, not huge and game changing for the world, but really delightful for me. There's so much more that I did in my one day in mixed reality, but that's all that I have time for in this talk. I just pulled out those couple of highlights for all of you. Um, let's talk about what I learned. So the first thing is let's let's go through those concepts. I definitely would say that they've been confirmed. There's absolutely situations where cognitive burden can be reduced. There's absolutely situations where human contact can be increased by mixed reality. There's absolutely situations where we can gain superpowers and there are so many surprises in store for all of us. You know, uh, this whole project of mine was done on a device in an ecosystem which is not designed for consumers. This is just the little bit of stuff that that people out in the in the world have created who are thinking similarly to me, who are, who are way out there ahead of, of where we really are with the, the product. And even still, I was impressed. I was surprised. I was delighted. And I just think that that we're just beginning to crest the wave of all of this. Um, and the other thing is that that this experience has brought up, of course, so many more questions for me. You know, one of the things that I didn't get to delve into that I had hoped I would is accessibility. How will it change us to have interfaces that pop out of our hands instead of having to be mounted to a specific place on the wall? Um, what will it mean for human contact if augmented reality interactions do get to be as good or better for human contact than even being in a physical place with the other person? We just don't know. Uh, maybe this is all fodder for my next talk. Um, anyway. Uh, I'd like to say, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming with me on this journey and for showing up to this talk. Uh, I love that there are so many people out there who are similarly interested and excited by this space and the potential that it has to change our lives and expand the capabilities of our species. Um, and of course, I'm ready for all of your questions. So uh, thanks a lot.